Welcome to the lab. We'll be showing you what it looks like. So because it's a bit of a it's a bit of a pity that we don't have the chance to come here physically. So we try to make this as uh, immersive as much as possible. Here you see all the danger signs to scare people away in a sense. And yeah, so what one sees at the very first instance of stepping into the lab is all the things on the table, perhaps, and all the things on the well, not say ceiling, but on the rack above. Right. And so um, I mentioned before that I'm, this is uh, Dimitri Masakevich lab. We work with trapped ions. Uh, we have our most recent work is on um, implementing quantum machine learning algorithms using our system of trapped ions, but with a twist, not in the same way that um, the sort of major players in the that use qubits do. We use the motion. Okay, so um, in addition to doing this sort of uh, machine learning applications, we have done very nice um, experiments in the past as well. It just happened to be that that's the direction we are taking now. So one of the interesting results that we had before was the so-called quantum adsorption refrigerator. Uh, we had what we had was three ions in a line, right? And then from there we form a fridge, right? So we made a fridge out of three ions, and then we asked a very interesting question: of What happens to thermodynamics when you have three ions? Because um, for those who have already known in Thermodynamics, you say that n, the number of particles involved, should tend to a large number, infinity, in fact. And so when you go down to three, you start to wonder, do you break thermodynamics? So there's all, all sorts of interesting answers that came out from the experiment. And before that, as well, prior to that, we were dealing with um, taking the way ions oscillate in a chain and then making them interact. So this is also another curiosity because um, for those who study classical physics, you will know that things that are oscillating they are described by so-called normal modes of motion, which means, uh, I mean, uh, in another way is that this way of oscillating should have no effect on this other way. And yet we are able to make them interact thanks to certain um, specific detail uh, that arises from the ion trap scenario, okay? So these are some of the experiments that we've done, it's nice. And so here now the lab choice to show you what actually goes on, right? It's no more of those, um, in theory, we can calculate stuff, we show you the, the nitty gritty stuff. Um, of making an experiment work. Okay? Now, the first important thing is that we want to get an ion. So if we come this way, we have an ongoing experiment now. And if I take a close look at somebody, I'll give you a, give you a moment. So probably in the other grad student. Yep. So if you look at the screen now, what you see here is an ion that is fluorescing. So why is it fluorescing? It's because, as I mentioned in the Doppler cooling uh, scenario, we are always scattering light, and this scattered light is being picked up. And that's how we know that that ion is there. So if I were to try to... Yeah, okay, so, so there happens to be another one as well, but it's in a, in a stuck in another state. So what we can do is to shake the trap around a bit, and you'll see that the ion jumps to another position. So there are actually two two positions that you can take. Yeah, so in this case, um, we are, that's how we know that there are two ions here. So what, so what was happening was that we were switching off so that the ions were trapped and we were switching it off and on a little bit to make it jump. Okay, so um, you can move here. Uh, are there any questions you want me to check? Yes, um, Yaron, would you, would you mind um, explaining what you're actually seeing when you see this iron? Like, how can you even see it? It's so small. Ah, okay. Maybe I have to bring us over to another spot now. Over here, um, there is this entire black-looking setup here. What this is, is a microscope objective that is trained onto the position of the ion, where the ion is trapped. And then, because we are shining the, the light onto the ion, we are doing Doppler cooling, it's always constantly fluorescing. That light that is coming out is being picked up and transferred to a huge camera over here. It's an expensive, good camera. And that's how we are able to see the ion, even though it's so tiny. And uh, um, yes, thanks for bringing that up. So the amazing thing is that it's a single, or in this case, two ions, which um, if you consider the number of particles in air, Order of 10 to the 20, right? So just two. It's a amazing feat, I think. Yeah, so are there any further questions? Nope, I don't think there's any more questions coming in the chat. 
Okay, so if we move on here, um, I just want to say that maybe the impression by now you would have had is that a lot of things don't look commercial, and that is correct. So the funny thing is that um, when I first started working in a lab, I realized that you can't just buy things that you want. Most of the time, um, people don't sell it. Like There's nobody to make the things that you want because you have a certain specification that you need, you need it to do this and that. So a lot of times it's um, economically, and also by choice, you prefer to make things yourself. And so if I may show you, maybe you want, maybe you don't. So if I may show you a close up, for example, in this case here, this would be an ion trap, a replica of the ion trap that is currently in, well, there are two chambers, so one of them, each, each in one. Um, where, as Muyong has mentioned, I, if I may, there are four, there are rods and there are needles. This is how small it is. Okay? So, um, in addition to having these rod traps, we are as well at the moment uh, investigating and experimenting on uh, newer generations of traps, uh, the so called blade trap, where we would have four, well, this is only like partially assembled, and this is a part of the prototype, where we assemble four blades. And that would also be able to trap ions. So in this, for this particular case, we have to learn things like how do we deal with uh, making ceramic work the way we want it to work, how do we machine it properly. We, we don't do it ourselves exactly, but there are lots of things to learn along the way. Um, how do we deposit a goal? And how do we, yeah, in general, how do we handle and make it happen? So um, this is just for scale. OK, so are there any questions about these things? If not, then I will say we can move on. Do you have any questions about the traps? Sorry, but Jaron, you just mentioned you use ceramics in the new trap, but the one to the left looks like it's metal. What materials are you, are you using for the trap, uh, for the old one and for the new one? Ah, yes. OK, so thanks for that question. So in this case, you are using stainless steel. Um, stainless steel is just good because you mostly have um, good, good vacuum properties and it's easier to machine in comparison to <laughs> the ceramics here. Um, yeah, so for the new traps, you will plan to uh, experiment using ceramics for all the sort of properties like, um, what do you call it? Uh, the thermal expansion coefficient and, and whatnot. So it is a lot harder to deal with, but it should promise better results. Interesting, thanks. Yeah, okay. So if we move on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so I have to put on my safety goggles now because um, the thing that I haven't been extremely talking about uh, would be the massive things on the table, right? So this, uh, the, this makes up the optical systems that is used for the experiments. So every one of these, Thing that you see there, every optical element, every mirror, every lens, every AOM, every EOM serves a purpose. And so um, there are, uh, in this case, for this 369 laser, we can't see it with our naked eye, so we have to use paper to see the fluorescence. Okay? And when it comes to dealing with laser, we have to be you have to like uphold the sort of discipline to not wear reflective materials because you don't want to actually cause somebody else to go blind. Uh, and so uh, here we have 369, and then we also have other portions for 780, uh, 935, 638. So an entire rainbow of colors is quite nice. Okay, and if I may bring you guys down to another part that has no laser, I must add, and to show you like. Part of the, I mentioned that we were dealing with uh, machine learning stuff. And so to make a quantum computer, there is this little guy here that would be sort of the part of the computer. It would be responsible for being able to uh, individually address, align a chain of ions. So this is like the so called multi channel uh, optical modulator. And then in general, you can see that um, there are many things that are partially commercial, partially home built. Like for example, something like this, which for oh, the detail is not very obvious, but this functions, this is a, a custom built periscope where we want to send the light uh, to a different height. 
And so this was also homemade. So that's about it for the view of the lab. Now, if you have any questions? Um, yeah, we do have one question about the trap. Um, so the trap, is, the question is, how do you design those traps? Uh, can I can I ask uh, for more details? So, so what, what do you mean by how do you design the trap? In what sense? I think it's, I think it's because um, you mentioned that uh, they were made in-house. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I think we are not, of course, the very, very first ones to come up with the design of the trap. So the trap design with the rods are known as a, a pole trap. So somebody else came up with the idea of putting it um, four rods and two needles. And it's only a matter of adapting it to your own taste in a sense. So somebody else came up with the, 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 the very smart idea. And then we just sort of copied and modified it and made it such that it will fit our setup. So for different groups, different labs around the world, they will have slightly different designs. And it's um, as long as you understand what are the important parts, you can change more or less the rest to see how it may help or may not help. In some sense. Uh, we have, oh, okay. A uh, uh, follow up questions about the track. Um, is it 3D printed or something? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's uh, not 3D printed. It's a traditionally, like, new in the traditional way with uh, big CNC machines now that we have. Some parts we outsource, so, but essentially it will still be a traditional milling technique. Um, we do have some, we, we do play with 3D printed materials. Uh, we had some experience, so for example, if I may show you, um, one of the elements, the import culture, Elements of the that make up the track. Um, I can't show that. Um, suffice to say that at some point we needed to wind some wires in some manner. And so, uh, in fact, we had a high school intern student who was with us for some time, and he had experience working with a 3D printer. And he, his task was to wind some wires um, that are supposed to have certain specific dimensions, certain radius, certain length. And then, so instead of doing it by hand or by machining another mold piece, he said, why not just 3D print it? It seems to be reasonably faster. And that was, it's like, that's when you know it's a great idea, right? Like there's no need to invest so much time, like a few weeks to machine this whole thing in metal, when you can just 3D print it. Thanks. Aaron. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's one more okay. there's one more question about the optical setup that you showed, which for which you needed to wear the safety glasses. So the question is what yes. is the setup used for? Ah, okay, so um, I mentioned several wavelengths. I just threw several wavelengths out, right? So Muyong was already uh, already alluded to the 369 nanometer transition that is used for doctor cooling, state detection, optical pumping. Essentially, each wavelength talks to a, a pair of energy levels. So for 369, that's our most, uh, basically the, the, the lifeline of the experiment. Without the 369, nothing had happened. And then apart from the 369, there are other levels that require addressing as well. So for instance, what happens is that sometimes when we try to doctor cool it, we keep cycling the transition, it may fall off some, to some other state. And then in order to get it back from those other states, we have to um, use a different wavelength of light. So that's where we use like the 638 red laser to repump or the 935 IR laser to repump. Um, there are also the uh, there's also another pulse laser that is hidden tucked in the way inside there. That one is responsible for the like the tie pulses, uh, so-called Raman transitions, uh, that we use as well. Any other questions? Ah, oh, okay. There's one more questions. Um. Right. Uh, let's go with the optical setup. A follow up question for the optical setup first. Yeah. Is the sample placed in the optical setup, or is the laser directed to the sample which is elsewhere? Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, good question. So, because we can, like, direct the light anywhere we want it to be, and because we know that the where the ion, the trap center is, is is a is a hot real estate, right? What you the scenario that you would always have to consider is so-called optical access. How much access in terms of optics do you have to the, to the center? So a lot of times, it, 
Nix, um, it's very reasonable to say, okay, all the things that make the light appear, we put them elsewhere. All the, the optics generated, we just shove them away. We guide them there, either by optical fibers or just by free space. And so that's what the setup um, has at the moment, which is it's surrounded by fibers and lenses that would look into the center because looking into the center is really the, the, the most important thing, the hottest property, so to say. That's always a good question. Uh, right. Okay. Yes. Okay. This one. Oh, the person said thank you. Uh, there's one more question about if do you guys do optical tweezer experiments in the lab? Optical tweezers experiment. Um, we don't quite need to do optical tweezers uh, because we have a, a ginormously strong trap which is the ion trap. So usually what people use optical tweezers for is like an, a, a, another form of a trap. So in neutral atom experiments, for example, where they do not have the luxury of big ion traps, this electromagnetic this RF trap, sorry, then they would always use optical tweezers as feedback. So from the mod that William was explaining, what you can do is you um, cool, try to take these atoms and load them into an optical tweezer and then try to cool, evaporate them and cool them further. That's how you go to even lower temperatures. So for us, we don't have to use it, but for else, uh, other labs downstairs, they do use it. Uh, 